Great. Hello, my name is Thomas Whittlesey, um, and uh, I'm uh, pleased to present uh, here for um, this event. Um, uh, we have uh, Kelsey Eccles um, uh, from the Conservation Fund in Atlanta. Uh, so she's here to talk about um, the Conservation Fund's role in developing a food forest and urban park in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so welcome, Kelsey. Thanks, Tom. Excited to be here. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, can you um, um, give us a brief overview of um, um, your background and what role the Conservation Fund plays uh, uh, in Atlanta in general? And then we could get into more of um, this uh, uh, park in specific? Sure. So um, I guess I'll start with my background and I feel obligated to say go dogs as a UGA um, um, myself. So I went to UGA and studied journalism um, was my major in environmental law as my minor. Um, and I knew that I, I wanted to pursue some type of um, career that helped me with sustainability or that focused on um, conservation to an extent. Um, and so I got to my senior year of college and was just like, I feel like I need to go to school again. I'm not ready for the real world yet. So I went to Mercer to get an MBA, um, which I focused on marketing with. Um, because I, I feel like a lot of times when we're talking about these big ideas, that are focused around environmental sustainability, one of the hardest obstacles is how do you talk about it in a way to where everybody can understand it? And so um, from there, I went to work at Earthshare of Georgia. And then now, um, since then, after leaving that, have been with the Conservation Fund. And so um, nationally, what our organization does, I think the best way to describe it is we're almost like a real estate agency for the government. So we go out and we purchase um, tracts of land that could be 0 0.01 acres, or it could be 300 acres. Um, and ultimately these spaces are being conserved for um, the purpose of land conservation. Um, and so that was kind of our, our role here in Atlanta. We really focus on urban conservation. So that could be a small pocket park um, for a community, or it could be a 7.1 acre food forest. Um, but we've also got a program at the fund called Parks with Purpose. Um, and in that program, we are primarily focused on urban communities that have historically been underserved um, so that we can provide some type of um, positive impact, whether that's for an economic benefit or for um, curbing some type of environmental justice issue that is that that community like faces. So in this instance, the food forest was planted in the middle of a community, which is a food desert to help provide um, affordable and healthy, affordable access to healthy foods. So, yeah. Can you define uh, what a uh, food desert is uh, for our audience? Sure, um, it's basically a, a area, um, most likely it's, it's in a, a urban area. Um, where residents just don't have access to healthy foods. And if they do have access to healthy foods, it might not be affordable. And so um, that's, that's, an, that's what a food desert is. Right, right. And um, is there some prevalence of food deserts in Atlanta? There is. Um, I think that there was a, a study that was done that I believe said it was 28% um of residents in Atlanta I'll have to double check that number live in what's considered a food desert wow. um if you if you look at the geography of how Atlanta is is laid out we're kind of divided by our highways so you've got 75 85 which goes north and then you've got 20 which goes east to west and below 20 um or I-20 the the highway that's where a lot of those um food desert communities exist. Um, but it also, to maybe no surprise, um, is also where a lot of the community of color, communities of color 
live in Atlanta. Um, and I think also kind of southeast of Atlanta, which is where the, the food forest is located. That's one of the larger um, kind of concentrations of communities that are considered part of a food desert. Mm. So creating affordable and maybe free access to healthy foods that are easily accessible that people could walk to uh, or get to very easily um, is a, it's a big issue. Um, and from what I've gathered that yeah, food deserts, it's, um, it's an issue for many um, states and cities uh, uh, around the country. So um, what you're doing, I think obviously has some really um, uh, great um, poignancy and uh, relevance to uh, you know our audience hopefully maybe uh, uh, extrapolating some uh, some of your ideas and some initiatives um, to do something similar uh, so that's great um, maybe you could um, tell me about how how the the food forest idea kind of came about and uh, and what led you to uh, do you arrive at the uh, Brown's Mill site in uh, Atlanta? Sure. Um, so I think something that comes to a surprise to a, a lot of people, myself included, before I started this job, um, you wonder how many people does it take to build a park? And I think sometimes people think, oh, like, you know, Parks and Rec, they just come in, yeah, right. hey, we're going to build this out. And that is not the case <laughs> at all. Um, this was definitely an effort that came from a, a long, long list of partners um, from a federal level all the way down to a community resident level. Um, and so back in 2016, the city of Atlanta's mayor's office of resilience um, was interested in, you know, building a food forest in the city of Atlanta. And so the USDA Forest Service had um, a community forest and open space conservation program. Um, and basically they were providing funding to local municipalities um, to create kind of projects that would help to support creating green spaces and communities, but also addressing some of those issues, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and so from the funding, the city of Atlanta applied for that funding and received the funding, um, and they were able to create a new position, um, which was an urban agriculture director. So mm -hmm. Joe Camberdella, I think <laughs> he told me that, I think he had been on the job for two weeks. Um, and at that time, the the chief sustainability officer for the city of Atlanta was just like, hey, like time to go build a park, like a, a food forest. That's your, your first thing on the job. And he's like, what? <laughs> um, and so Mario um, went out and kind of said, okay, well, the first thing is acquisition. How do we, how do we search and scout for like what parcel of land will be best for this? Um, and so he reached out to the conservation fund. We have a longstanding partnership with the city of Atlanta, uh, with purchasing different parks across the, and green spaces across the city. Um, and we came across a property that's in the Browns Mill community. Um, it was actually slated to, it was, it was owned by a developer, it was slated to be developed, but I think that development kind of fizzled away. Um, we did some of our due diligence to see, okay, what's the historical use of this land? Because obviously when you're in urban areas, one thing you've got to think about is, you know, is this contaminated soil? Is this a safe that will be a space that will be safe um, for, for growing food? And so we found out that this land actually was historically used by um, a family who farmed, um, and they would basically take the excess produce that they didn't use for themselves and hang it on the fence, and community members could just come by and grab it. And so. Cool divine intervention whatever the case but it's like wow this is perfect um and at that time the largest food forest in the country was seven acres this was 7.1 acres and so we we're great like we'll we'll make the largest food forest um in the country and so um the conservation fund worked to purchase the land um but kind of the next step to that was that Parks with Purpose program I was telling you about earlier, it's like, okay, we don't wanna just purchase this and 
throw it back on the city and say, all right, you've got the space, make a food for us, good luck. All right. Understood the importance of equitable development. And so we were like, there needs to be buy-in um, from community members prior to building this space out. And so um, we worked with Sustenance Design, which is a um, landscape architecture company, and they came in and they did a community visioning process. So I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Um, and, and what came out of that was a community vision plan where community members got to decide, which can you guys see my screen? I, I usually check. Yes, maybe scroll okay. it up, up a little bit. There, yep. that's better. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna like kind of take us through it. So um, this, this was a, a community vision plan that kind of came out of that where community members were brought to the table to say, okay, in a food forest, what are the amenities that you all would like to see? Um, and so there's a, a parking lot, a small parking lot here. Um, this is a community garden, which the parking lot currently exists. The community garden area currently exists. There's also a hoop house. Um, the privacy fence was put in place so that the community residents living here were just like, you know, it's going to be a lot of plants. I don't want deers or, you know, in <laughs> my backyard. <laughs> so we gave them that privacy fence. And also because this is a public space, you know, they wanted to have a sense of separation. Sure. This area is a, a orchard area here. Um, this area here is, um, there's a little bit of, uh, I don't want to say, it's a space where they're paying homage to the Morgan family. That's the family I mentioned. Um, had owned the, the land, um, well as some beehives that are over here, um, and then some more additional parking. And then there's also some walking trails that take you to the back end of the property. Um, and this is an existing stream that goes into the South River um, watershed here in Atlanta. So as you can see, it's a very... Um, it's a very open space, um, except for here, you can see that this is where most of the kind of um, planting is. But for, for the most part, the land back here is, is fairly unaltered, mostly just maintained to make sure that native plants are doing well. Um, and there also is a medicinal herb garden area in the back of this space as well. So um, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of funding to, mm -hmm um to get this project kind of fully built out and so that's kind of an ongoing effort that's still being stewarded um, by the friends of brown's mill group um, which is led by swazet lumpkin and then also celestial care um, celeste lomax is another community member who really is has been on the ground to do the ongoing maintenance um, and some fundraising um, to bring more funding to get some of these other things built out that community members said they wanted to have back in 2016. So, so 2016 is when this vision plan came in. And yep. when did you officially break ground on getting it built? So I think we, it was later in 2017 when we actually like broke ground on it. Mm -hmm. And, and we, so the conservation fund owned the property like from 2017, basically to 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and at 2018, in 2018, that was the point where we were able to transfer the property over to the city of Atlanta to make it an official city park um, or food forest area. Great. The, uh, and so you've had some growing time there. Uh, and uh, um but maybe, yeah, we could back up and talk a little bit about, um, yeah, um, uh, I guess, first of all, how do you define a food forest? Because we throw that term around a lot and maybe that's new to some people in our audience. Um, sure, so um, I'm gonna share my screen again to show you guys, this is a great diagram um, that shows the layers of a food forest. Um, and so as you can see, there are seven layers. Um, 
The first being a canopy, which has large fruit trees and nut trees. And you've got a low tree layer. So that'll be more like your apple trees, um, trees that don't really grow kind of large. Um, and then you've got your shrub layer, which includes like your berry bushes. Um, and then you've got your herb herbaceous um, layer, which is flowers, herbs, garden, or herb garden, um, vegetables. And then for your soil surface, which I will add at the food forest um, for accessibility purposes, we've got large raised garden beds. Um, so that way it's, it's nicer on your back um, as a volunteer when you're <laughs> helping to build these things out. Um, but then you've got your, your soil surface. So that's where you've got your low growing ground covers. So I know that we've got um, over at the food forest, there's strawberry patches. Um, and that is something that is directly in the ground. Um, and then you've got your root layer. So um, fungi, root vegetables. Um, I know that right now, which they're in the, the raised garden beds, but they would realistically, um, garlic would be something that you could find in like your root layer. Mm -hmm. um, and then for seven, you've got your, your vertical layers. So that could be anything. Um, we've got some trellises in the community garden. So that's where you've got your raspberries and things that grow along vines to um, grow up. So essentially what makes a food forest different than a farm um, really boils down to having these seven layers. Um, and so I'll say that this is something that I learned from um, Celeste Lomax and Rosemary Griffin, Doug Hardman, um, and some of the other um, community members who have been at the table to really help to build this space out. So it's it's really, uh, there's a lot of um, integration of uh, uh, different uh, species, but also different scale sizes of uh, plants and really trying to layer them into um, same space, uh, kind of get the maximum productivity out of it. Um, and a lot of perennial um, uh, plants and trees that will uh, produce year after year and probably get better and better in time is, is a bit of my understanding of how they are intended to function. Um, um, and hopefully lower maintenance too than maybe annual crops, which are more typical for agriculture. Um, so, um, and I'll, I'll add too, I think um, to that point, it really speaks to kind of the urban like heat island effect that a lot of the partners that um, have come to the table, West Atlanta Watershed Alliance is one of those partners. Um, by having a forest, around this area, it minimizes the amount of invasives because it's, you know, it's covering the, the ground so that way there's not a lot of sunlight to help those invasives grow up. Um, but it also provides kind of a, a, a place for people to just kind of walk through and wind down. Um, so it, it focuses on um, having, having healthy canopy cover to make sure that the, the, the right amount of lighting um, is getting to the right types of plants. So like, for example, I was showing you guys on the community vision plan that the herb garden is also located in the back of the forest. That's because that area does have a large canopy cover, cover and some of those herbs um, do well in low light settings. And so it really is about having a, a clear understanding of where certain things go. Um, but it also speaks to how a food forest outside of providing benefits for food, it also provides benefits for um, climate change and making sure that you've got um, kind of multi-benefited parts of the forest. All right, those are great points. Um, yeah, from what I understand that, uh, uh, yeah, with urban heat, heat island effect that in cities, you have all these black top and black roofs that will re-radiate the heat and raise the temperature in cities like four or more degrees. So adding tree cover is really essential and, um, and they, they do transpiration um, to cool the air through the, the moisture. And so it's a real net positive there. And maybe we can 
circle back to some of the conservation things you're doing, but I also want to just talk about like the food aspect and um, is there, how do you, how does that work for um, the community? Do you, do you just sort of leave it open-ended that people can come and go and pick and uh, harvest stuff on their own? Or is it sort of programmed out more that um, it's kind of around a schedule or how does that work? Um, yeah, so um, there's, at least in terms of the maintenance, most of the volunteers on site are the immediate community members who live around so they come out and they worked with the city of Atlanta because I think when the food forest first opened up in 2018, there was like a, a mad rush of people from all over coming to harvest things. And they were so excited about it. And I think they, they had a, a vision in their mind of like Willy Wonka's chocolate factory, but <laughs> produce like in the city of Atlanta. And at that point, um, you know, the, the space really was in its infancy and it was more for educational purposes. And so we've been committed to the space. Um, Rosemary, Doug, Celeste, like I mentioned earlier, went to the city of Atlanta and was like, whoa, we need harvest guidelines. Some of our plants are being destroyed because people are just coming in and like ripping, mm. don't understand how to properly harvest it. Um, so you'll see signs all around the food forest. I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, but you also see that the, um, on the Atlanta website, which is the, the division of the city of Atlanta that currently kind of manages um, the space, they've got um, some different kind of harvest guidelines to the community garden space to make sure that, you know, if people are coming out to the food forest, they understand the proper way to harvest. Um, and they also host different volunteer events and educational programming to ensure that as people are coming in, they learn about what they're taking. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the really important thing is the reason why this space was built out and that was to address the food desert issue that immediate community members faced. And so um, to that point, um, the volunteers who are on site just about every day as they're doing their harvesting, they make sure to reach out directly to community members um, right around a space to say, hey, all right, guys, we've got kale this week. If anybody's interested in coming to get some kale, let us know and they'll like set it aside. So that way they can ensure that the, almost the first harvest, if you will, goes to the people who need it most. And that's the mm -hmm. residents who live right around the area. Um, I'll also say that Swazette Lumpkin, who leads the Friends of Food Forest Group has done a really great job working with the um, UGA and Fulton County Cooperative Extension to host um, different food drives and things. Because we understand, like I mentioned, the, the percentage of communities that are located um, in food deserts in the city of Atlanta. Obviously there are people from other communities who have the same need. Um, so if they happen to come over, then um, I know she had a, a programming a program, especially when the pandemic first started, um, that also provided produce that they, that didn't necessarily come from the food forest, but would still provide access um, to fresh produce for others that came um, to the food forest. And that, that was in partnership with a lot of the local churches around the food forest space as well. So um, it, it was a little bit of a reactive thing. It wasn't a, I don't think it was something that we proactively thought to have harvest guidelines and did, we didn't think that we would need it. But after that initial rush, rush um, we understood, okay, we've got to have some ground rules here and we've got to make sure that um, the community members that this was built for are the ones who are benefiting from the harvest that's coming um, out of the food forest. Right, right. Um, and it takes time uh, for uh, a lot of those uh, trees um, and, uh, uh, excuse the uh, thunder if you can hear that in the background. Um, Same here. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, that many yeah, fruit trees, especially, it would take three, five, maybe even ten years to um, nut trees even longer. Um, so it may be some time, I imagine, for some of those and you to uh, really be able to yield. Um, uh, 
the abundance that the, for the community. Uh, um, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna say I'll add. I was um, I was out at the food forest last week just to check on the volunteers and community members, and we are seeing very small buds on apple trees for the first time that were right. planted back in 2017, and so now here we are five years later in 2022 um and it's like okay I guess I can start budding now so that I really appreciate you making that point I think a lot of people um don't understand kind of the time that it takes for um this type of agriculture to really start to produce and to flower out right right um and yeah you touched on education being a really uh, important component and maybe it wasn't even I think it would be easy to not anticipate that, but yeah, that so many people don't have a upbringing farming or, you know, working with, you know, these kinds of uh, plants and trees. So um, yeah, there's a, there's a learning curve and how to work with it, how to care for it, how to harvest it. Um, so, but it sounds like you guys have really responded to that with kind of a grassroots level to integrate education and, uh, and try to kind of uh, have some level of a filter there to, um, you know, direct that interaction with the park and uh, and so forth. Um, that's great. Um, was the was everybody in the community uh, immediately receptive to it, or was there um, kind of an education component with that part too, developing the, the project? Yeah, I think, um, and that's that's. A great question, and it, it speaks to kind of the common ground um, of doing community work and community engagement. Um, just taking everything out of context and looking just at the optics of it, if you are going to a, in the city of Atlanta, which has experienced gentrification, which has experienced um, rapid growth, affordable housing is unfortunately seeming like a thing of the past um and you've got a group of predominantly white organizations coming into a historically black and brown community to say hey guys like we're gonna drop this yeah. huge amenity in the middle of your community and it's gonna be great for you you're gonna love it right. and i'm sure you can only imagine the like are you what in the world is this kind of response that <laughs> everyone got um but i think that one of the things that allowed the conservation fund to do it the right way was that it wasn't that we we came in and said we're going to build a food forest and this is what it's going to include and this is what it's going to have it was this is a food desert and we want to build a food forest that provides amenities that you all would like to see and that provides um, some of the, some support, I'll say like to some of the issues that you guys face. And so um, for us, one of the things that we were met with was community members saying, so who's gonna build this out? Are y'all gonna bring in some more random white people to help build this out? Because we've got teenagers right here who need jobs and who could work on this. And so the conservation fund said, okay. So we reached out to Greening Youth Foundation, um, which is a nonprofit that provides kind of workforce training and development. And they did hyper local um, recruitment for some you know, young adults and teenagers who needed income and um, helped to build the park out. So they actually built out the composting area, that privacy fence, they built that out. They built out the garden area, um, helped to do some of the landscaping to level the land out. And so it was kind of mutually beneficial in one, providing these um, soft skill and hard skill trainings um, to these community members in hopes that that would lead to a pipeline for them to get jobs, whether that's in masonry or construction or um, right. general like build out of spaces. Um, and- Fantastic. Yeah, like it was, it was like, how do, how do we address 
you know, those economic issues that you you guys are facing, like in in building out this park. And so um, the other thing was bringing sustenance design to the table for community members to decide and having to go to community um, events. Elizabeth Beek, who's with the city of Atlanta is amazing. Um, and she helped to lead some of those community events um, where community members were coming to the table to one, understand, okay, maybe these aren't random white people. These are people who actually care about, you know, us and care about the amenities that are coming into here and trying to figure out ways to um, help mitigate some of the change that this might bring to our community and understand what we want. So I think that was definitely a, a pretty big obstacle um, for us to, to jump through. And that wasn't just the conservation fund attending those community meetings. It was members from the USDA Forest Service who were also attending those meetings, City of Atlanta, um, Greening Youth Foundation, some of the other partners um, that we were able to kind of bring into the table and who have consistently played a role in ensuring um, that community members really took ownership over this space. So that way, as the community changes and evolves, those community members who are already at the table have established themselves as um, kind of the owners of this space. And so that way people respect that um, sense of ownership. I think that's a really excellent point. I mean, it's it's awesome to hear that that's, you know, a big part of why this was so successful. Um, and, uh, but yeah, that, the true sustainable development isn't just community development, but it has that economic development com um, component. Um, and from everything I've gathered from successful sustainable development projects around the world, really a huge part is getting local community buy-in and, and that you can't just sort of take this external vision and just plunk it in and plug it in and think it's going to work uh, but you need to really talk to the people in that community and really invite them into the process like it sounds like you did uh, perfectly and um and 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 that they become authors in, in a sense of this vision and they um and it sounds like they were involved um, in the vision plan as well, um, which seems like a pretty key component to developing um, such a park. Um, so um, do the, uh, is the youth program, do they continue to go on uh, engaging and kind of further projects like planting out and maintaining some of the park or um, are they still involved somehow? So um, not Greening Youth Foundation at the moment because they're, um, I mean, the, the park, at least for the funding that is available now is built out. So like the, the compost area is still in good shape. So is the community garden area, um, the hoop house that was added to it, um, all of the kind of like capital components of the, the food forest are built out. So there's not, um, the youth engagement through Greening Youth Foundation per se, but um, Celeste Lomax has a Grow to Glow program um, where it's an after school program as well as a summer program um, where kids are coming in to learn about agriculture, um, but it's also a space for kids to decompress and to get a better appreciation for outside and understanding that nature um, can exist in an accessible way. You don't have to go up to the North Georgia mountains if you know if you don't have access to get up there, but you can maybe experience something similar um, within walking distance from your home. And so I know she's got karate courses out there, um, teaches the kids about like herbal teas that you can use um, with some of the herbs that are grown at the space um, in case they've got a tummy ache or they, they're congested, they can go home and tell their parents about it. Um, and encourage their parents to also take on more of an herbal and holistic approach to their physical health as well. So, that's yeah. fantastic. Um, yeah, I mean, it really also ties into you know um, a higher level of nutritional health and uh, um, and some other things you touched on. Like it, it's uh, it's not 
and this is part of what I, I I forget what to call it because it, it seems like it's a park, it's a um, farm, it's a food forest, it's a place for nature, but it's all of those things. But it, probably one of the most important is that it's a civic space and community gathering space and a place for people to go and feel like it's a safe space and chill out and uh, learn stuff and meet friends. And uh, so I feel like that's a probably maybe underappreciated, but maybe one of the most important aspects um, of such a place. Uh, would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll say it's a um, another really cool aspect of it is it's a very intergenerational space. Mm. So, um, so I was at Lumpkin who leads up the food forest, um, friends of the food forest group. Right before the pandemic, she was doing um, senior day like at the food forest. And so you could come out and you could do um, like chair exercises and um, helping with like doing some weeding in the community garden space. Um, they also, I think Celeste at that event taught some of the elders in the community of the different teas that they could use to help with um, congestion and arthritis and, you know, other, other types of ailments that you face as you age. Yeah. Um, and so it, it really speaks to the fact that you've got this programming that's happening and that's community led, which is so powerful. Um, but it's, it's for all ages. You don't have to be like young and a whippersnapper to just get out there and help to pull up, you know, huge plants or things like that. It really does focus on um, making sure that everybody of every age, um, not just in the community, but from all communities can come across. They've worked with um, some of the historically black college and universities like Spelman College and Morehouse. Um, mm -hmm also bring out student volunteers to the space as well. So it really is, I think this is the, the ultimate um, showcase of it takes a village. Um, mm -hmm. It takes a, a village to raise a child and it takes a village to raise a food forest for sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's fantastic. So yeah, it's become a real nucleus of the community, it sounds like. Um, yeah. The, uh, I was wondering if you could also touch on a little bit um, you know, it really serves some conservation purposes. You know, we talked a little bit about the environmental um, uh, cooling effects uh, with the forest, but uh, sounds like you're also giving consideration to uh, how it deals with water and, uh, uh, and soil health. Um, um, maybe without getting hyper-technical about it, you could talk a little bit about some of those uh, goals and how they're working out. Yeah, sure. So um, in terms of how the, the community garden area is watered, there's a irrigation system that was built throughout it. So you don't see the random sprinklers going off like in the peak heat of Atlanta summer and it's not really doing anything. Um, there was a lot of intention behind making sure that um, adequate irrigation was throughout the community garden space and the orchard space um, in a way so that way you're not dealing with um, wasted water, I guess I, I would say. Um, there's also a well that community members can use, um, but they can pump like water from the well to, you know, do kind of additional um, watering in the space as well. Um, I think in terms of conservation outcomes. Um, there's a space at the, the food forest and you can, you can see it also when you're walking towards the back of the property where there's more canopy cover, but um, a lot of birds like migratory birds, you'll see them um, coming through the space as well. We actually hosted a, which I still, I owe so many people an apology for this, but we hosted a STEM science festival and we had 200 second graders on site at the same time. I'm sorry to be part of that <laughs> I did do, but um, they, they were able to learn about um, kind of what goes on in their watershed. A lot of people realize that they live in a watershed because they might not see water on their property. Right. Um, and so there's been a little bit of work 
um, well, students were able to learn about like their watershed. We had um, some, some birders out there working with Atlanta Audubon Society, which I think now might be Georgia Audubon, um, to come out and show kids the different birds that were out there, but also to get kids to understand this is how binoculars work. So um, it, it really does speak to some of the, the biodiversity, I guess, that, that has, even if it hasn't necessarily grown, which I can't speak to if it's grown or not, the awareness about it has grown um, because the programming is in place to make sure that, you know, kids can see a, a warbler or whatever, a, a robin, um, that they might hear the sound when they wake up in the morning, but to be able to see that bird, I think is what really um, has been a, a powerful um, role that the food forest has also played. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. Uh, and um, I think just the fact that you're adding a lot of uh, more diverse species that wouldn't be normally appearing in an urban environment would naturally uh, uh, attract a lot of species, especially birds um, and, and a food source for them um, as well. Um, they will be happy to see some of those fruits uh, and such. Uh, so um, yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and I, I saw something about, yeah, you had mycoremediation using mushrooms to clean soil too. Yes. So there's, um, there's a grow and learn program that I believe happens on every Saturday and then weed and water Wednesdays that also happens. Um, there's a guy, Dave, I cannot remember Dave's last name, but he lit a series of, um, mushroom inoculation courses, um, where community members could come out and along the, the walking paths that go throughout the food forest, um, some of those logs are there. So you can start to different mushrooms and stuff um, sparking up. And then there's also, um, I know in the community garden area, they use the three sisters um, method, which is a Native American method of, I think it's squash, beans, and corn. Corn, yep. Yes, um, that they grow to in the in the beds to help to keep the soil enriched. And um, while this is growing up, they have students. I know they invited students from Padilla at one point um, to learn about the Three Sisters method as well. So there's a lot of intentional um, strategy behind what's grown at what times um, to make sure that the soil remains in good condition. Um, for the the longevity of the food forest. Right, right. Yeah, the soil health is key to the, the forest health. Um, so um, I guess I, I don't know where we're at on time, but I just wanted to make sure that we leave a little time to talk about um, um, maybe where are you planning to do more um, parks in this manner since it's been so successful to try to target other areas. Um, in Atlanta or other parts of Georgia? Um. Yeah, um, I will say, I'm not sure, at least in terms of the conservation funds role um, mm -hmm. in it, but I, I know that the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, um, which is another amazing organization, um, they are housed on another city park, which is the Outdoor Activity Center in Southwest Atlanta. Um, and they have been working with the city of Atlanta to potentially create Atlanta's second food forest. Um, the, the naming of urban food forest at Brown's Mill um, was done in a way because they're hoping to um, expand this model to have the urban food forest at the Outdoor Activity Center as kind of the next um, food forest space. Um, at least in terms of the conservation fund, um, because we have a national footprint and especially with our Parks with Purpose program, um, some of our other partners have adopted um, some of the, the programming. So there's a Atlanta Watershed Learning Network that now has expanded to a Durham and Raleigh Watershed Learning Network. Um, but also in, in Durham, North Carolina, we're working with the Merrick Moore community um, and they've got a space where they have an area where they wanna build out a community garden. Um, but after learning about the food forest, they were like, maybe we could have a food forest too. So um, it's something that we're, we're definitely always open to connecting 
the right papers at the table. Um, but if there's a, a acquisition that's needed um, from kind of an established partner, then I think we would certainly be open to playing that role as long as the city partner is willing to accept creating the food forest for that area. So that's great. Because uh, yeah, I think the the direction or we I'd like us to try to lead us yeah towards yeah how can other people in their communities get started on this. It sounds probably, I mean, with so many benefits, how could it not seem appealing? Um, but it, you know, undoubtedly is probably a, a big long-term endeavor. So, you know, what might you suggest for where to begin um, in their communities and, uh, and how to sort of organize? I mean, would they reach out to somebody like your company first or, or how do they go about initiating something like this yeah so i will um as i talk about this just give you guys some visuals so it's not just <laughs> us talking about it but i do i think that um like i mentioned before there really is um a, a series of partners who have to be at the table um to kind of build this out so i think that the the first step certainly we're open at the conservation fund to having people to reach out to us to say, okay, like, you know, what's the first step? Um, in our case, it was the city of Atlanta approached us about wanting to do this. And the city of Atlanta also approached um, the USDA Forest Service to get some of the funding to spark this. So I think it really starts from making sure that you've got buy-in from your um, local city government to see if they want to bring this type of space um, to your city. I think from there, um, that's when you can start to think about, okay, who's a, a organization that can lead some type of community visioning or some type of process where community members can come in to say, these are the types of amenities that we would want in a food forest space. Here in Atlanta, um, Park Pride is a great organization. They did not do the visioning for this space, but they have done a very, they have an excellent community visioning program that they've done for some of the other parks that we work in. Um, so if you can find an organization that is, and, and these are nonprofits usually, um, that's dedicated to that. I think the other thing that's really important is understanding the, the dynamics of the communities that you're working in. So do you need to have an organization that can provide um, training about you know racial equity and inclusion do you need an organization that can come in and say okay before the city comes into this community let's make sure that you're well versed on kind of the historical context of this space and how you can do work in a way that's not harmful um i think that you need an organization that can also um help with fundraising and building out um, the capacity of the community members to then create um, a friends of group or some type of group that's going to be committed to maintenance. I know here in Atlanta, our city parks department, they will take out the trash and they will mow the grass and they will do some of the kind of basic maintenance, but I'm sure you can imagine that that's, that doesn't cut it for a food forest. So who's going to be at the table um, to make sure that the maintenance is an ongoing thing um as well so um i think if, if you had to get a checklist of okay who all do we need at the table um based based on that you can come up with your own timeline of when to bring those people um into the process i will say community members should be some of the first if not the first group of people that you bring um to the table but i think if you've got all of those partners together you should be able to have a pretty good start um to ensure that you can start your own food for us. So, but if you've if you got questions, um Aglanta is the office, our the current um Ur urban agriculture um director is Jay Olu Baiwayu. Um also Elizabeth Beek, who I, I mentioned earlier, is another great um person to reach out to. Um, I think in terms of on the ground, okay. What does it take to get this done? Reaching out to some of those community members I mentioned earlier, like Celeste Lomax, um, Swazette Lumpkin, Rosemary Griffin, 
um, those are really the experts of how this land is stewarded and how this, this programming um, can be beneficial to the community members there, so. That's great. Um, and maybe we can provide some uh, links and uh, resources um, to supplement this video interview uh, for people to check out that could be some starting points for them. Um, and, uh, um, but yeah, it sounds like a, not just getting these um, more large scale players uh, in the development process, but trying to do whatever you can to organize locally. Um, you know, maybe it's going door to door with, you know, kind of just petitions and flyers and information to try to see if there's the interest level in that community and talk about the prospect. Um, maybe Facebook groups of people are online or something could get started. And, but I think some of those things could be really helpful to kind of get that neighborhood level kind of interest going. And uh, um, maybe you could talk about, I think one of the probably more challenging pieces is, is land um, and how people can think about or, and, and maybe approach that too. And, you know, site selection, um, but uh, it seems like there can often be some, you know, residual spaces, you know, off the edges of some street or infrastructure or some, um, you know, maybe site that got sort of dilapidated or something. And uh, um, maybe, you know, so what could people do in sort of those regards to try to hone in on where they could find a space? Uh, any suggestions around that? Yeah, um, I think I would say that one, you've got to figure out who owns the property. Um, a lot of times, especially in, in urban areas, it might, even if it's a, a vacant area, it might still be privately held. Um, so if you've got some type of, um, here in Atlanta, we've got the NPU neighborhood planning unit system. Um, and Part of that, MPUs play a huge role in zoning, which determines how the space can be used. Um, and so I think that if you're in Atlanta, that's a, a great place to start is with your MPU to determine, okay, do we know who the owner of this vacant property is? And is there a way for us to get in contact with them to see if this would be something they would be interested in? Right. Um, I think an another thing that would be helpful in terms of private ownership is if you um, <clears throat> have access to the resources to think about, okay, well, I want a, you know, a small raised um, garden bed in my own backyard, um, maybe using that as a, I don't wanna say like the, the jump start, but in a, in a sense, it's, it's a way to get the people immediately around you, your neighbors and your community members to see like, look, I grow my own, collard greens for Thanksgiving or whatever the case is and, and getting them kind of excited about the idea of agriculture um, to kind of spark that idea of, hey, this is something I want to do in my backyard too. And just watching that idea grow and evolve. Um, and I think the more awareness you bring around it and the more interest that you can bring around it, um, the more likely you are, I won't say the more likely, but the the more that you're, you're elective representatives might buy into, okay, well, let's really check out some vacant spaces that we can use. Um, I know here in Atlanta, Atlanta also manages some of the green roofs. Um, so if you are riding MARTA, which is our public trans transit system here in Atlanta, um, there are some urban ag spaces um, on some of the MARTA properties that they own and at some of the train stations. Um, so yeah, I think that that's, it's, it's all about somebody seeing something cool and saying, hey, let's do this, not I want to do this. And so bringing other people um, to the table to, to really buy into that idea um, is, is honestly a great way to, to get more um, buy-in to look at some of these other vacant properties. Right, and I think if you can, yeah, I mean, hopefully people like looking at Brown's Mill will see how awesome it is and be excited about all the potential um, it holds and 
you know, could hold for their community. Um, so I think the and there's so many levels and layers of why it can really benefit the community. So it's shouldn't be hard for people to get behind, but I think it sounds like you really need people to take that extra step to, um, you know, really drive this through. And, and as you said, it, it's not a, it's not a snap of the fingers and um, it happens. It's a, it's a long-term endeavor. So I didn't know if you had any suggestions on like, how do people carry that torch and maybe um, through kind of this longer term, you know, it could take a few years, uh, maybe even a decade to kind of get to this um, groundbreaking kind of point. But um, uh, especially when there's so many different players, um, any, any uh, things you could speak to how to inspire or, or, or guide people to um, kind of, carry that on uh, through that long timeline? Yeah, I think um, every, every space needs a champion, right? So you've got to have somebody who um, is really interested in kind of seeing this through and continuing to ask the right questions to get to the right people um, to make sure it happens. But then there's also, you've got the people who don't mind shaking the table to, you know, hold accountability for um, different people who've said like, hey, we're gonna, yeah, we'll help manage this or we'll help support this. And if they start to fall apart, fall back on some of those commitments, holding them accountable to those things. Um, so you, you, need, you need multiple people at the table, um, but making sure that you've got, um, you've got the, the people who can actually be on the ground to do and to build and to get the partnerships going. And then you've got your people who are basically your accountability partners who are like, all right, you said you're gonna do this, like get on it and make sure it continues to happen. And if you can't do it, like somebody who's like, okay, well, we'll find somebody else who is willing to do it and who has the capacity to do it. Um, but yeah, I think it, it takes, um, having those, those multiple people who work together to ensure that the longevity of something like this can continue. Right. They can kind of rely on each other and hold each other accountable. And, um, and again, I think that grassroots level is really important. Um, that neighborhood level, uh, it's the people that are living there that they may well outlast the politicians and that are in the zoning planning offices and other positions that um, may be more temporary. But uh, so um, that's great. Um, so um, I guess uh, we're probably almost out of time, but um, do you have any um, other ideas or things that you think you'd like to share for you know, for people to get getting their own uh, food forest um, projects. Um, I mean, maybe speak to some of the challenges uh, that you faced and or maybe how they can overcome some of those um, um, before we uh, end our talk. Yeah, um, I would say one, don't feel like you've got to reinvent the wheel. Um, the idea of accessible food in a community is not a new idea. This is something that, you know, it was a practice all the way back to Native American practices. It's, it's a practice that um, is almost regenerating itself. Um, the Urban Food Forest um, group has a pretty dynamic Facebook page. So if you've got Facebook, you can follow them. Um, they are open to talking about kind of their process and how this all came about and how this continues to work. Um, trying to think what else. In terms of challenges, I think you've got to be open to having the difficult conversations and just don't take it personal. You know, like community members at the end of the day, if you're coming in and you're a stranger, um, you probably do the same thing if you opened your front door and somebody was just kind of standing on your steps like, hi, ah, it's like, okay. so <laughs> you've got to, you've got to be aware of the fact that you're going to have to have difficult conversations. Um, but ultimately it's so worth it because of the relationships that you're able to build. 
um, in a really authentic way to, to make sure that you're working um, in partnership, not just with the community members, but with all of the organizations from a government, nonprofit, whatever standpoint. So stay the course. I feel like that's the best way I can say it. It's, 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 it's not an easy task to just build a food forest, but I think it is certainly worth it when you look at the um, massive amount of positive incomes um, or outcomes that, that come as a result of having this type of dynamic space um, in your community. Very well put. Thank you so much for sharing um, with us. Uh, yeah, it's a fabulous project and uh, um, I'm really excited about it and, uh, and I hope it continues to keep growing in all the wonderful uh, ways that it is in benefiting the community. And hopefully you can do more around uh, Atlanta and Georgia soon. Um, I would just say yeah, um, for our audience watching, um, hopefully this has inspired you to do something similar in your community and we can uh, um, create a great network across the country with a, a food forest. So, uh, um, and we'll post some links um, to Browns Mill and, uh, and T um, TCF and um, uh, hopefully some other organizations that could help you um, learn about and maybe um, get a foothold on, on what you could do in your own community. Um, and maybe there's some people through those um, uh, links that could perhaps consult with you uh, on starting your own. So uh, uh, so thank you again, um, uh, Kelsey, and uh, good luck to you with everything. Great, thanks, Tom, I really appreciate it. All right, take care.